Do you consider yourself a high achiever? Smart, driven, highly successful? I am so excited to have you. My name is Julia Arndt and I'm the host of the Stress Podcast. I will help you develop your stress resilience the same way you've developed your workplace superpowers. Learn peak performance tools to thrive at work and in your personal life. Let's get started. Hey everyone and welcome back to the Stress Podcast. I am really excited as always to welcome our next podcast guest to the show and it is Marie Gervais. How, Marie, how are you doing today? I'm doing just great. Thank you. So nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me to be on your podcast. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to have you. Thank you. I am. It's my pleasure to have you, really. Um, I was just looking at your website, as I was saying, um, and I was looking at all of the different amazing things that you have been doing throughout your life. And I'm really excited to have a chat with you today about um, all the things, about well-being in the workplace, about leadership. Um, but before we jump into all of these different things, I would say let's just start with three very simple questions. Where are you located? What time is it? And what have you been up to this morning? I'm located in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. It is now 12 noon. And uh, so already it's the middle of the day. But I always start my day with a morning routine, which is about an hour long. Mm -hmm. I get up at five and I do meditations and prayers. I do uh, EFT tapping. I do virtues cards pick. I reflect, I either write in a journal or I draw something. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's that's what I start with. And then I have an exercise routine that I do alternating between aerobic um, and um, mus musculation. And then the other one is is yoga, stretching and toning. So um, that's that's what I do every morning for an hour and a half. It's always the same. It's been like that for almost, almost well, I'd say 35 years because when my children were really little, it was hard to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was more like a five and 10 minutes something together with them. But, uh, but now they're grown up and have their own children. And so, yeah, my own, my own practice has been like that for quite some time. Wow, that's incredible. And then after your morning routine, what did you get into? Uh, well, then I, I go to work. <laughs> this mm -hmm. is my office that I'm in right now. And mm -hmm. I do coaching uh, uh, for people typically that are in the middle of a career change or a career transition. So either they're moving into a new industry or they're moving into a new phase in their lives or they're having difficulties with their workplace and um, with relationships in the workplace or how they are, their role in the workplace. So that's usually most of my clients are in that particular um, piece of um, career Mm -hmm. shifting. And um, I work, I help people a lot with work traumas that they've been through. So when they, you know, they've, people don't realize how much trauma you suffer at work. And mm -hmm. so that's, that, that's also led to the book that I, that I wrote and recently published a week ago called The Spirit of Work, Timeless Wisdom, Current Realities. Wow. Uh, Congratulations. And, and thank you. <laughs> I'm sure that's a huge uh, weight off your shoulder. <laughs> well, Yes and no. <laughs> okay. Because each each piece, like the milestone is having the book published, but once it's published, then you have to sell it mm -hmm. so you can recuperate your costs. And um, mm -hmm. and it, there's quite a, a lot of cost and labor involved in creating, in publishing a book. So unless okay. you have already had multiple publications and somebody wants to turn your book into a screenplay where they say, hey, we'll pay for the costs, <laughs> that doesn't, that's like less than 1% of most authors. <laughs> So mm -hmm. whether you're with a publishing company or whether you're whether you're self-publishing or something in between, you always have to put all this work into getting it all up to there. And then when the book is published, it's exciting and you're, you feel relieved that it's done, but you still then have to move into that next That's phase the of other, yeah. letting people know about it. But so far, the book has been selling very well. Um, let's see, this is, this is the, yeah, because I've done a few presentations us. about the book, so this one has the has the there sticky is. notes on it for different presentations, but um, it's been selling well. And I made a couple of bestseller lists without trying to do that because um, I'm not interested in wasting my time. I'm trying to game the system. So, but that happened on its own. So that was really, really nice. That's awesome. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. And um, you. did you self-publish the book or do you have a publisher? I, I'm with Friesen Press, uh, but I'm in the middle. So I'm not the self-published totally. And I'm not at the, you know, pay a lot of money and have them do everything. I'm in the middle. So 
I paid for pieces of it and pieces of it I did, pieces of it they did, but they have a really nice program. Love working with Reason Press. So if anyone wants to publish, I recommend them highly. Mm, very great. Thank you so much. Um, I love that you were so explicit about your morning routine and what you're doing every day and like how many years you've been doing this. And, you know, it's a very, a very clear uh, process. <laughs> Has I mean, obviously it's been like that for many years, but how did you initially get into that? Do you remember that time where you were like, maybe I should be really specific about what I'm doing? Was that like a conscious decision, how you were setting up your morning routine? Yeah, it was a conscious decision. And because, uh, well, 43 years ago, I switched from being um, a Catholic to a Baha'i. And it's mm -hmm. a very... Um, it was a really interesting shift into world-mindedness and to understanding um, religion from the perspective of the entire planet and all of the chap all everything is being a chapter of a book, um, the book of humanity is realizing its full potential. And so um, I wanted to be more, one of the obligations of a, of a Baha'i, there aren't that many, is, is to pray morning and evening um, mm -hmm. and to read from the sacred writings uh, of the Baha'i faith and any other, any religion uh, as well. And to just reflect on them and see how you can align your life with those principles. So I started doing that just like five minutes a day. And then mm -hmm. I started adding on more. So because mm -hmm. I learned other kinds of things to add on to it and everybody has to make it their own, their own, th your practice has to become your own. So I just started doing that. And, and it was because it had a home. So it was always, always first thing in the morning because at night I'm just dead tired And I, mm -hmm. I go, I have a night routine, which is basically just winding down and then uh, reading one page and going to sleep. But, uh, but in the morning, I'm, I'm more focused and alert. And so it wasn't hard for me to add other pieces to it because it already had a place to live in my schedule. So when people try to find a place for exercise or they find a, pl a place for reflection or a place for journaling and they, and they go, I'll do it when I have time, it never works because it doesn't live anywhere. So I already mm -hmm. had that home for it. So that's why it was it wasn't that hard to fit it in. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Good, good, uh, good tips in there as well of like how to start a mo morning routine, which is something that I really practice and preach as well. Um, so I'm glad that you are mentioning that as well. And uh, Marie, what have you been uh, working on over the last few years, besides obviously your coaching business and you published a book. So there's already two big pieces that I'm sure are taking a lot of your time, but what else, mm -hmm. um, You know, how did you get into all of this work? What kind of background do you have? I'm really curious to hear more about that. Well, this is my fourth career and it is the 15th year in my business. So the business is my, my fourth career. And I started out with um, a doctorate in culture and leadership in the workplace that I already had a management background and I had an education background and I'd worked with everything from preschool children all the way up to seniors and everything in between. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and then I and I also uh, worked in uh, management and sales for a while, and mm -hmm. so that allow, uh, allowed me to consider how I could translate the culture and workplace pieces, which at the time in Alberta in the in a boom economy was not people just were considered disposable commodities, and they were mm -hmm. they were more interested in getting people to get some basic leadership skills in place than actually understanding and using the people from a variety of cultures that were that they were hiring and so but now that people want very employers want very much to keep whoever they've got and they're recognizing the value that diverse populations are bringing and so now there's it's easy to weave intercultural and diversity and inclusion pieces into everything but mm. you know 15 years ago that was not the case so that's how I started uh, there and I developed a number of courses by just speaking to people in industry and finding out what the employers wanted and what their supervisors and middle managers were experiencing. And, and, mm -hmm. and it became then a piece where I was, because I already had a background in curriculum writing. So I have written a lot of curriculum and multimedia resources for, for various, um, you know, various employers. And then I thought the thing to do would be to put my own courses out there. So that's what I started to do about um, six years ago. So I have, mm -hmm. I have a supervisory leadership course. I have another one that's um, almost ready as part two. And then I have a number of other things, you know, psychological safety in the workplace, productivity toolkit, um, managing a virtual workforce, things like that of, are all um, various different courses that I have. And as I was doing that, people kept people would say, well, can you work with this person or this person because we want to groom them up to this? 
um, and they need a little extra help. And so I started with coaching and then I went back and got some training and a variety of different modalities. And I'm working on my, my master certification for uh, emotional freedom techniques to, um, to be able to use, uh, to be able to use that, uh, the, that modality and all the other things that go along with it and get my international coaching certificate, which I, I'm very close to, but I'm not quite there. I'll be there in July. July is when I will have finished everything. So wow. yeah, 365 hours of work this year. <laughs> so it's not a small commitment. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is incredible. Mm -hmm. you, are, you seem like a very busy lady. <laughs> yeah. And I have uh, four adult children, five grand grandsons. And uh, they don't all live in the same place. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's that. And then I have also the mm -hmm. community uh, development, local community development activities that I also do. So I have um, a neighborhood art class that I do with ch children. I used to direct theater and also choir. And I'm not doing that right now. I'm just doing the neighborhood art class, which I really love. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I have another uh, sort of a spiritual and moral education neighborhood class for kids that just started up. And that's been really fun for them. And the kids go home talking to their parents about things that they can do to make the world a better place. And it's pretty exciting. So mm -hmm. those are, I, I am involved in those neighborhood projects as well. Wow. Um, that's really cool. And I feel like I, we could probably fill five hours now of a podcast interview, but I know that we um, obviously want to keep it to an hour for today, at least. <laughs> and one of the questions that I actually have that I'm really curious about is um, the, your religion. Um, can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that and how you got into that? Like, how do you discover this religion? Yeah, the Baha'i faith is the most recent of the world religions, So it's 200 years old. And okay. um, the The, the mandate of the Baha'i faith is world peace, which is what we definitely need right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and justice. Uh, there's there, The founder was Baha'u'llah, which means the glory of God. He, come, he claims to be the, re, the return, the expected return in all of the world religions, different mm -hmm. per, for each religion. The fifth Buddha, the twelfth Imam, the return of Christ. Um, and, and with bringing teachers, teachings that are for helping us to re recognize that we're all part of the same Religions are all the chapters of what the same book. Mm -hmm. So it's one book. It's like everybody walking up different parts of the mountain. Um, and our goal is to have a, to realize our own potential and to create a just, equitable, and happy and healthy society. And so to do that, we have the teachings of the Baha'i faith are like the equality of women and men. Is there any world religion that says women and men are equal? And that mm -hmm. if you need to choose between educating girl children and boy children because you have a budget, pick the girls. That happened 200 years ago in Iran. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Science and religion are one truth. Um, and so if you just have science, it's materialism. If you just have religion, it becomes fanaticism. So you have to work together. Um, mm -hmm. That education is, is human, material, and spiritual. And we need all three in order to be whole, rounded people. So that just gives you a little bit of a taste. Um, and also there's a very strong emphasis on unity in diversity, that you can't have unity unless you actually bring all the diverse voices to the table and that there, and that there's justice and equity in the way people are communicating with each other and working with each other. And mm -hmm. so that's been an initiative all over the world that's really been transformational for many, um, many, many societies and cultures. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that gives you a little bit of a taste Okay. It's a, it's a And how did you get? How did you like hear about it? Or I like, went to a garage sale when I was pregnant with my first son, <laughs> and they had stuff from all over the world. It was like being in a, you know United Nations pavilion or something. And I said, "Where did you get all this stuff from all over the world?" And the and the people that were there said, "Oh well, we're Baha'is, so we're always trying to learn more about other cultures so we can be better world citizens." And I went, "Sign me up! Sign me up! How do I do this?" <laughs> and so yeah. the woman who's running the garage sale said. Well, I'm kind of busy with the garage sale right now, but tomorrow I'll bring you a book and then next week we can talk. <laughs> nice. That's how I, that's how I found that's out about it. That's how it, it all started. From there. Yeah. And when I Very saw this diverse community and how people were really, really striving to work together and how sincere mm -hmm. everybody was and how it wasn't a fake thing. It was a, you know, we're trying to do this. We're not perfect, but we're working at it. I was very taken by it. So mm -hmm. there's a, the rest of it is another long story, but that's how I found out about it first. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay, so I want to start with your book um, because I find the description of your book very interesting. I'm going to read it. 
Um, it says the spirit of work, timeless wisdom, current realities, combines ancient wisdom, modern science, and real world examples to share insights on how to develop a soul sustaining workplace culture. It offers a high level yet approachable model to rethink how we view and structure work. This is a book for leaders, change makers, and anyone who yearns to build a humane and sustainable system of work. Um, and what really caught my attention when I was reading this was the combining ancient wisdom. And so now that you're telling me about your religion, I'm curious if, if that is kind of the ancient wisdom that you brought into the book as well. Well, that's part of it, but um, because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just saying, okay, well, let me just look at what the Baha'i writings have to say. There's lots because there are over a hundred volumes that were written. So there's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a lot to look, to look for, but I, th I thought I wanted to look in all the world religions to find out what's there. And also, stories like for example in Judaism there are a lot of stories and so I like I looked for stories I looked I looked for um, specific quotes about the workplace and I looked for commonalities so it was a lot of research the book has mm -hmm. about 25 pages worth of uh, reference references in the back but mm -hmm. it doesn't read like an academic paper it's very mm -hmm. it's very readable so because um, it has so many stories in it and so that was part one and then part two was what has science uh, taught us and showed us to contribute to having happy and healthy workplaces where people expand their potential and where mm -hmm. you can be productive without, without it becoming um, cancerous. And, and then I also looked at, well, what are workplaces already doing? What's working? What's mm -hmm. not working? And how can we analyze it using some of some principles? So the, one of the principles in the book is the idea of soul enhancing versus soul diminishing thoughts, words, and actions. So soul enhancing would be what expands your potential, makes you feel happier, more joyful, makes you feel ready to contribute. It promotes creativity. There, you, you notice virtues happening. You see people communicating. You see people listening to each other. That, that kind of behavior is soul enhancing. Soul diminishing is crushing, humiliating, hurtful, um, gossip, backbiting, um, you know, trying to sabotage people and ruin their reputations, all of that kind of stuff is soul diminishing behavior. So when people realize that they, that what they do is either soul enhancing or soul diminishing, they're more likely to choose something that's soul enhancing, not that they will every time, but they're more likely to do it. And when they don't, they're compassionate with themselves and say, well, tomorrow's a new day. I can try it again. Right. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. part of being soul enhancing is being compassionate to yourself as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it that's the that's the main thrust of the book and then i also use a model i developed called the swell model which is safety well-being encouragement and learning so if you just ask yourself is this safe how is it safe for everybody who uses it when we're creating it are we all safe is this physically safe psychologically safe intellectually safe you, you go ask yourself those questions when if a workplace asks themselves those questions when this product or service is finished, how will it be disposed of? Will it be safe? Just starting there is, would transform completely workplaces. Mm -hmm. And then the next part is well-being, because once you're safe, then how do you explore the potential that's starting to blossom everywhere? It's not mm -hmm. just about having a gym membership or giving people swag. It's about how can you contribute most fully? And how can um, I can incorporate you? And how can we work to create a healing culture as part of the workplace? And then encouragement, because we live in a very um, critical, critical um, uh, environment. So we're criticizing ourselves, we're criticizing each other, we're judging all the time. And, um, and it's just in all of the discourse, you only have to listen to five or 10 minutes and you hear criticism and, um, and, neg and really negative ways of people speaking about everything and everybody. And so if you can switch that around to how can I be encouraging? Will this be encouraging? Will this be helpful? Is this honest and kind at the same time? Building a culture of encouragement is really important for having a soul enhancing workplace. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you don't see problems or that you don't address them. It just means that you're encouraging in the way that you work with people and that when there's a problem you, together, you think, how can we, how can we solve this? Um, mm -hmm. So, and then the last one is learning. Everybody that's learning and every workplace that's learning is, is advancing. So what are we learning? How are we learning it? Um, what are the ways that we learn in our company? Mm -hmm. So putting all that together gives you pretty much a way to get to soul enhancing workplaces and corrects a lot of problems, auto corrects a lot of them as people start focusing on that model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And as you were doing your research on what companies were already doing and what was lacking, what were, what were the biggest things that were lacking? Um, what's lacking mostly is jumping to conclusions, not considering the whole picture and looking for short-term benefits instead of looking at the whole picture. Think about mm -hmm. creating a 10-year or a 50-year plan instead of what's the, first, what's the next quarter bringing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you can still look at the, the quarters and measure within the quarters, but you're doing it within the context of a plan where you have a vision and you have a goal and is what we're doing getting us closer to that goal or not. That's usually what's missing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and encouragement is missing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then do you go in and um, train um, employees as well or leaders? Is that part of your... Well, I have the courses and coaching that I do. Some of it is group coaching and the course, courses are all um, with numbers of em uh, employees, usually in middle and upper management. And mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I have been incorporating some of these principles as I was writing the book because I've been thinking about it for 10 years and it's mm -hmm. like a life work, right? And mm -hmm. so using pieces of it and then now putting it into specifically into the models and teaching the models to people. I've just started doing that. And people are starting to use it. So I can't say that I have huge results from it yet because it's just, mm -hmm. just starting. But now that the book is published, it makes it a little bit easier. Very nice. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, as you know, I'm sure, obviously, since the pandemic, the burnout rates have significantly increased. Um, you know, related to your model that you've been talking about, what do you see as the, are the biggest shortcomings that companies are not paying attention to? Um, the main thing is focusing on the shortcomings. Mm -hmm. It's what you pay attention to grows. So what's working and how can we get do more of that mm -hmm. is the is the most important thing. So mm -hmm. if we're always looking at what do I need to fix? What's wrong? How do I adjust? Uh, how do I deal with this weakness? How do we you know address all the problems in the system? You actually don't grow it very fast. It just, the problems just multiply. So what's working mm -hmm. is the best. It's called appreciative inquiry. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you start looking to see what's working and then you start saying, wow, this is great. How can we make this more explicit? How can we use this more? What's, and then you say, okay, now what's missing from this so that we can get it to that next level. So it starts from appreciation rather than deficit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that only a company's work? Or how do the individuals take part in that? That's a great question. So the, uh, the book looks at everything from three perspectives, the individual, the community, and the institution. So mm -hmm. the individual has the power to act and to implement change. The community has the power to encourage and support and build. And the institution has the power to make the framework workable to um, administer Uh, justice and to build a culture consciously. And so if all three stakeholders are working together and they each consider what their role is, it it's really lovely. So, mm -hmm. and then people don't step out of their role in the sense that the individual doesn't try to administer the policy because that's not their job. That's the institution's job. The institution mm -hmm. administers the policy. So, but, and the community doesn't try to take on the role of the institution or the individual. They take on the role of support. So when people see what their important roles are, and you may be an individual in a community, in an institution, so you have a different role each time. Mm -hmm. So seeing that is very useful for people to understand what the three protagonists are in workplace health, individual, community, and institution. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I And I totally agree with that too. I think it's super important that individuals are doing their part as well. They can't just expect the company to make the changes because they can create the framework for the employees, um, you know, to support them and to encourage them. But then it's on the employee to to take that as well, you know, to use mm -hmm. those resources and to, to implement them and to take action. So yeah, 100% agree on that. You know, um, When I was doing more in-person in work, now I do a lot less in-person work, but when I was doing in-person work, we used to play this or have this exercise that was called step to center. So everybody would stand in a, in a circle and without speaking and without making any kind of gestures or anything like that, they would each one person at a time take one step to the center. That's it. Not two steps, not a giant step, not one step back and then one step forward, just 
one. And if the mm-hmm. group, if the group couldn't do it, if somebody made a mistake, if they jump in or someone would talk or whatever, then you'd all have to go back and start again. Mm-hmm. And it's a very simple task, but it really builds unity. And it shows that people need to, everyone needs to take their place in that circle because the mm-hmm. circle isn't complete without them, but they also have mm-hmm. to watch to see when's the right time, when's it appropriate, be sensitive to the group. And so mm-hmm. they have to look at the group. They have to think, when can I step in? And it, it's really beautiful to see when they can actually, when they can do it. Some groups that are already very unified in their thinking and the way that they work with each other, just do it within a few seconds. Others, most of the others have a lot more trouble. And sometimes mm-hmm. there's somebody who's really, aggressive and insists on not doing it right so when that happens i would have you would say so i would like you to step out of the group and watch observe what's going on and then tell us what you saw then we're inviting you back in to join Mm -hmm. and that usually auto corrected whatever the 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 piece was and then you can play that game with higher stakes with large sticks (laughs) Uh you have to throw the stick in a pattern and everybody's responsible for their own safety and the safety of everyone else in the group Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you do that, you really see how what I do really matters and what you do really matters and what we do together, paying attention to each other is it. That's our job. Mm -hmm. So I've had uh, companies do the step to center. Even I taught it to them virtually on Zoom Mm -hmm. and then they do it in their company on their plant floor or whatever it was that they were doing. They do that step to center and it Everybody said it had amazing results because it, it's so it's so simple, but yeah, not that easy to do. It's a very so strong visualization exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, I'm also really interested to hear a little bit more about um, the destructive workplace cultural assumptions. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Because you you want to build a positive structure, but then there are also things that we don't realize that we've taken on. Mm-hmm. And even through our DNA in utero, because of intergenerational trauma, there isn't a single culture in the world that hasn't suffered intergenerational trauma. Mm-hmm. So, and some much worse than others and for a longer period of time. So we're, so there's all this intergenerational trauma that comes through. There's familial trauma. Like I think of my mother's family on her side, uh, uh, you know, she, she had, um, I mean, her father was an alcoholic, um, her oldest brother and her youngest brother committed suicide. They never talked about that. Obviously, that's affecting the way she's parenting me, right? Mm -hmm. My father Mm -hmm. lived through two wars and then immigrated to Canada. How does that, you know, so this, this, this piece, you you carry that with you. Um, And then people breathe the prejudices that are around them. So the Mm -hmm. most obvious prejudice around where I live is, is just prejudice against the indigenous peoples of Canada. Mm-hmm. And so much so to the point where First Nations communities have no running water and they don't have electricity. And, uh, you know, like how can that happen when the town 10 kilometers away from them or five kilometers away from them has those things and has had since the 1800s? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, they're not, if people are treated inequitably when, in the health system. If there's something that happens to them and they go to the police, they're, they're dismissed and it's, it's considered not serious. So that's people just breathe that in. And even if they consciously, just like Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, even if they consciously work to eliminate prejudice, it's still there. Mm-hmm. So that, that is what is the biggest negative force that comes into, into the workforce. So prejudice against race, ethnicity, language, accent, religion, and culture. And the other piece is gender prejudice. So, and it's just everywhere. And there's still no place in the world where women are paid the same amount of money for men doing the same job. Mm -hmm. And where women are hired for potential, they're always hired for what they've already accomplished and then dismissed if they make any mistake. Men are hired for potential. And if they make a mistake, they're told that they're learning. So, these kinds of these are the kinds of things that really, really affect the workplace. And the third thing I address in the book is courage. How do you gain courage in an institutional setting, like in a, in a corporate setting, in a setting where every move that you make is a politi- could be considered a political move. Mm-hmm. Uh, every move that you make could come back and bite you. Um, and at the same time, if you say nothing, you're responsible for perpetrating a lot of the injustices that have been going on for a long time. How do you do it? How do you deal with that? Mm 
what do you do? Mm -hmm. So I talk Mm -hmm. about courage in a variety of different settings as part of that. That's the Mm -hmm. last part of the book. Mm -hmm. So first we look at what we need to create all the positive, bring your body to work, bring your mind to work, bring your soul to work, bring your heart to work. And then you are bringing your community to work, but do you really know who you're bringing with you? That's where Mm -hmm. you address the, the, the inequities and the prejudices. And then you look to see how can I practice courage? And that's how the book ends practicing mm-hmm. courage and practicing courage would be the solution to overcoming those um cultural prejudice no that's one of the things that you can do okay. as an individual mm-hmm. and um and you know how can how can workplaces become courageous workplaces mm-hmm. and you know courageous in addressing problems when they're coming up courageous in accepting that th- things are ch- trends are changing and the industry needs to change mm-hmm you know, courageous in thinking about taking care of their employees rather than just saying, if I don't need them, goodbye. Mm-hmm. There's, there are a lot of ways that we can look at courage. It's not the solution, but it's one way to, to move towards a more equitable workplace. Yeah, that's really, uh, really powerful. Um, there's so many other things I want to ask you. So let me see what else um, I wanted to get, get with you into. Um, I had a thought and I left. Ah, there it is, actually. Um, you were talking earlier about um, productivity. Um, and this is a big thing that I, I love to talk about. And I know a lot of uh, people, you know, that are listening to the podcast are really curious about kind of productivity systems and how they can get more productive, how can, they can take care of themselves while sustaining their performance. Um, I'm kind of curious to hear a little bit more about what you have there and what, what you teach people on how to um, be more productive. Yeah, I, I love the whole concept of pr- productivity. And, um, and, and I also recognize that the downside is that people become obsessed with being productive and they, they then do damage to themselves and to everything mm-hmm. around them. So mm-hmm. I've been looking at uh, productivity sort of every year with a new theme. And mm-hmm. uh, my, my, my team develops something called productivity tools every year. And mm-hmm. um, there, you know, last year was get focused, which was great during, during uh, COVID. So it was 12 months of specific things that people can do that take a page or two pages of it gives you a little tool and then Mm -hmm. exercises that you can do to, to, to focus when you're feeling confused, frustrated and scattered and stressed. So that was last year. Mm -hmm. Um, The the first year before that was get organized and this year is get systematic. So we're looking Mm -hmm. at, and this year, the, the, the four themes, one per quarter, first one is the power of one power of two, the power of team and the power of scale. So the power of one is um, recognizing your own internal systems. And mm-hmm. um, so, you know, morning routines is a, is a system, is an internal system. Um, mm-hmm. Recognizing what your processes you need to go through in order to arrive at a decision is an internal system. So recognizing that. So that's power of one. And then the power of two is the power of two people talking, communicating w- between two people, the systems that people use to communicate and are they working for you and um, what your communication tendencies are with one other person. And then moving to, towards starting to plan systematically with another person. And then the power of team is what kinds of systems, human systems are in place to enable teams to reach that place of well-being and, and uh, peak productivity. And mm-hmm. um, it's not about the technology that you use. The technology is secondary once you work through the processes, you choose the technology or create the technology that works for those for, for you. And then the last one is about when you found something that's working, how do you scale it up? or Mm -hmm. evolve it into the next level so it's all getting systematic but it using human systems and human communications as the basis so Mm -hmm. that's how i work with productivity okay and uh, are there any systems that you found that that resonate the most with you or that you find the most uh, effective well um yes (laughs) lots of them i use lots of them i use communication systems, I use virtue systems, I use spiritual principle systems, and I use technology systems. Um, mm-hmm. So what do you want to hear about? Um, more the technology, honestly, um, because I think that's what people are kind of curious about oftentimes. Okay, so for technology, I ha- we have, we're really careful t- to make the difference between what's a collaborative tool and what's a communication team tool, and what's mm-hmm. an external uh, tool. So for the, the external tools, uh, email and social media, for the internal tools, we use um, 
Viber, we use Google Docs. Um, we use a bunch of other tools within those that feed into that. Um, mm -hmm. We use a lot of tools for analysis and um, mm -hmm. and and we, we use a really nice one on our website called Key, Keyword Hero. Really recommend that one. Um, mm -hmm. And what that one does is that um, it helps you find all the keywords because Google doesn't allow you to see all the keywords that you that you want to see. It helps you find all the keywords that are ranking on your, on your website and and gives you suggestions for what you should do differently and helps streamline them. So yeah, I love that one. That's a great tool. Um, yeah, and then collaborative collaborative tools. I I think people um, uh, we use you know like we use a lot of different types of spreadsheets and we've used monday.com we use, but right mm -hmm. now we use mainly Trello. I know that sounds probably old, but we've every year we work through no, two or three yeah. new systems to see which ones we like best. And for our yeah. team, Trello seems to work best. So we just keep using Trello. Um, mm -hmm. So we use Trello to track um, and then we use Viber to communicate internally and then um, collaborative doc shared documents on Google. Mm -hmm. And then we have regular meetings on Zoom and so it doesn't really matter whether you use Zoom or Google Meet or Teams or um, any of any of those, as long as you have regular meeting dates and that you have uh, types of meetings and you're, you're clear on what type of meeting you're having and what the, you want, uh, want those outcomes to be from that meeting. So if it's a brainstorming mm -hmm. meeting, all you're doing is generating ideas. You're not evaluating them till the end uh, when you pick some. If it's a walkthrough meeting, you only do the walkthrough. If the check-in meeting, you do the check-in. If it's a how are we all feeling about this right now meeting, then it's completely different. So being really clear mm -hmm. about the type of meeting you want to have, then that also means you bring in different technology tools depending on the meeting. Yeah, I don't know yeah, if that helps. It's not. That's, it's that's not... really good. No, it's really interesting. I love. It's uh, it's very impressive how structured your thinking is as well, and how big is your team? There are five of us, three core, and then two part-time. Okay. Amazing. And so what is your, what, what is your mission, Marie, with every, with all of these different things? If you could like, you know, flick a magic wand and say, this is really what I, what I would want to bring into the world or what I really um, would like to see the world change to, what would it be? Happy, healthy, and productive workplaces through inspired mm -hmm. leadership. Mm-hmm. And what would be if I could choose just one tool? So, okay, actually, I have a good question. <laughs> Let's do it in, in two ways. So for the individual that is listening right now, what can they do in order to achieve that? Pick one thing you want to do for a morning routine, just for a minute, and then expand on it. I think that's mm -hmm. the, most, the most important one because it brings self-awareness and inner mm -hmm. calm. And allows you to be mm -hmm. more focused and centered when you're making other decisions. I'd say that's the that's wow. the best one. If you want a second one, start embracing soul enhancing thoughts, words, and deeds. Thinking is this soul enhancing or soul diminishing, and then just adjust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that'd be for the individual. And, okay, and for the team, practice encouragement and look for the good in the other people and build them up. Mm -hmm. That's really mm -hmm. important. And then, what can you what can you contribute and then that's specific to you and then what can others contribute that would be specific to them so that you're mm -hmm. better using the diversity of skills and talents you have on your team yeah so going away from this mindset of what can I gain to what can I contribute it's all about what can I contribute you gain when you can when you have the mentality of what can I how do I how can I best serve mm -hmm. that's when you get the biggest gain but right? if you think what can I get out of this you're going to get the low, lowest returns mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for the organization? Uh, I think they could use the justice quotient model that I have in the book, which is to make sure that um, all stakeholders are there, that whoever is most affected has a, has a voice, um, and that, there's, that you have actively sought out diversity of contribution. And if you mm -hmm. do that and you look at your company decisions, it's going to be super powerful for you. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Great. Um, we do have a little bit more time and I do want to use it if that's okay with you, <laughs> because sure. um, one of the things, and I, I like that we're kind of now, you know, closing the loop on a few of these things because you started with your morning routine and now we're kind of back at the power of a morning routine and how much more happy and focused people can actually be with that and build that awareness, which I love. I'm glad that you're saying that. So, so, you know, with so much conviction and um, love because I totally love my morning routine as well. And I really believe that's really helping me. 
And when mm -hmm. I don't do it, I also feel not as, you know, not as productive. Scattered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Scattered and tired and all the things. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that you started to talk about at the beginning of our call um, and our interview, which I thought was also, which, you know, made me very curious to talk with you more about it is um, trauma in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And um, can you maybe just give us a couple of different examples of what those kind of traumas can be? Because you were saying a lot of people actually don't really know that they are actually experiencing trauma or that there are things um, that are happening. And, you know, you mentioned some kind of overarching themes like bullying or like, you know, target on the back, things like that. Um, but could you give us maybe some specific examples? So um, I'll tell you a story about yeah, um, a, a friend of mine who's from Cameroon. She has a very qualified accountant with, with degrees and designations from three continents. And then she comes, she, and many of the jobs that she, she got when she first started out, and this is now she's in a better position, but initially people would not greet her in the hallway. She'd say hello to them and they would just act as if she, they hadn't heard her, as if she was invisible. If she'd go into their office to ask them a question, they would be very annoyed. But any other colleague who wasn't Black <laughs> and who wasn't from Cameroon mm -hmm. would, you know, would be greeted with, sure, what's, well, how can I help? Um, whenever there was a lunch or an event, they never invited her. Her name was never on the staff meeting agendas. That's a workplace trauma. Mm -hmm. Being excluded is like dying. Mm -hmm. that's how that's that's one and also knowing that it's based on people's fear of you because of the color of your skin mm -hmm. it's like a double trauma it's a it's a moral trauma mm -hmm. because it's so unjust so that's that's one example but it can also just be someone talking over you all the time. I've had that experience a lot as a woman in a ma mostly male dominated um, situations where I was lots of times I couldn't say anything without somebody speaking over me or negating what I said and then saying it again. And then everybody claps for them because it was such a great idea when it was, when I was the one who said it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. And after that happens over and over and over again, you start to get, you start to get triggered by it. So at mm -hmm. that point it's become a trauma, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that when I first became alerted to this was a while ago, it was like 20 years ago, I took a course on arts research and we had to, we had to do two projects. One project was about an experience that we felt we needed to resolve using an artistic exploration. Mm -hmm. And the other one was an experience of communication without language. So the communication without language, I interviewed three immigrant families who didn't speak English and I didn't speak their language. And I mean, I speak French and some German, but I didn't speak and the, any of their languages. And I interviewed them by looking at their family photos. So I had to have an interpreter to explain just the context. And then afterwards, the interpreter didn't say anything because we were just using gestures and pointing and they, you know, they would go like, you know, sad like this, and sad like that and happy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you, you got Mm -hmm. The interpretation happened with a language. And so mm -hmm. I took pictures of their family photos of, and it was all about them at work. So, I mean, there were pictures of them with their diploma and then in their first job and then with their first boss and with their first team. And so um, looking at that and then also at their schooling. So I got to see the difference between the two countries, schools, the classrooms, the, the sort of atmosphere, how it was in one country, there's a girl's school and a boy's school. And, you know, in another, like it, it was just all, it was very interesting to see that so I had pictures of all of that on one side of the hallway and on the other side of the hallway when I did my exhibit was um, the experience that I had of um, uh, being hired and asked a couple of months into the job to train somebody that they wanted to groom into another position um, a, a man who they felt didn't have the necessary uh, people skills and so I was supposed to do some things to help him uh, with his meeting behaviors and with his classroom behaviors which I did and which he was able to do a little bit better. Um, and then afterwards they hired him and fired me. And so um, he was fired three months later because of inappropriate sexual conduct. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so uh, any rate, they, so it, that was a workplace trauma for me. And I mm -hmm, work, mm -hmm. worked it out by taking pictures of 
empty rooms or rooms, you know, here's the doorway and there's people meeting and you're looking from the outside. And I took pictures like that. Uh, you know, I took, took pictures of empty file um, drawers and uh, com computers that, that said this, this, this account no longer exists and stuff like that. So things like mm -hmm. that. And I put those, those pictures up on the hallway. So all of that was on the other side of the hallway and a big, big brick wall at the beginning and then a pathway. And at the end, me going, like this, right? So mm -hmm. um, this the the immigrant families who were uh, com coming to see their own exhibit, they spent a little bit of time there, and then they went spent all their time on my exhibit with my workplace trauma, and they all they went like like this, and then they went to my heart like this, and, and they went like that, and then like this, and they they said we feel for you, right? And this is me too, and and mm -hmm. I was so affected by that. It was. <laughs> Wow. Three families from completely different places on the globe had the same feelings about work that I had. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of me thinking about, I need to write a book about workplace sadness. It didn't become, but that, that's not exactly what I wrote about, but how to overcome mm -hmm. that, how to create happier, healthier, more close workplaces. So, yeah. yeah, so that, that was, that was, that was the piece. And, and I can also think of traumas from my parents, right? So my father had a learning disability and um, had to learn English was his third language. And so by the time he, he came through various different, different jobs, and he ended up being a nursing orderly. So it's like being a nursing assistant, um, even lower down in the nursing assistant um, in, the, in the healthcare system. And um, he, he got a, a workplace evaluation by someone he didn't know, like the person had never met him and uh, had never seen his work. And gave him this really negative workplace evaluation and said that he was not going to be um, moved up on the salary grid as a result. And he had no idea who this was or where this was coming from. And he was very bitter about it to the end of his life. It was really a trauma for him. How could someone mm -hmm. who doesn't know me want to do this to me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and my mother had a similar experience when she was uh, teaching in a school where she was bullied by the, prin the principal um, until she left the school because he only wanted people that he'd chosen. He didn't want any of the people that had been there from the previous principal. So mm. he bullied the others until they all left. And this mm. was just so devastating for my mother. <laughs> mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. So she actually ended her career in a much better place. At, so she was thankful in the end that she was ousted into a better place where she was much happier. And my father did too. So the, the trauma became transformative in the end. Uh, and that was the other piece that I was thinking, well, Trauma doesn't have to stay. You can mm -hmm. use it to transform to the next piece. Mm -hmm. And so how, when someone is listening right now and they have experienced workplace trauma, what is maybe one or two tools that they can apply in order to transform it? Um, I think you can say I am feeling, you know, when I think about my relationship to this experience, right now I feel sad or I feel bitter, Right. Right now, that's how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. It's important to say that right now, a part of me feels bitter about this experience. Mm -hmm. And when you name it, especially when you say it or write it down or tap it using tapping points, the tapping points on your, your face and your hand, um, it releases. So that it comes up and out and it starts to, starts to release. And you're, mm -hmm. the feeling, the bad feeling that's been controlling you is no longer controlling you because you've named it. And therefore, you're, you are... Mm -hmm in charge of it, right? You're not controlling it, but you don't need to because it's dissipated. So I think that mm -hmm. that's probably the most important thing is to name what's bothering you. And the more specific, the better. I'm feeling bitter. I'm feeling worried. I'm feeling anxious. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about this incident, right now I'm feeling this way when I think about it. And it's just a part of me that's thinking that because that way it mm -hmm. opens up the realm of possibility for you to, to heal and to move on to new things. So I would say that that's a really important and simple, simple tool, but not so easy to do is because most of us are not used to naming our feelings. We don't have a feelings vocabulary of maybe four words when there are thousands of words we could use. Mm -hmm. So um, another thing that could be a useful tool is to just, just go into Google and Google emotions vocabulary or emotions list. And you're going to, whoa, there's like 300 words for emotions. I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and start using them in the way that you speak. Mm -hmm. That yeah. really helps because the, as you name the emotions, the emotions can release from you. If you can't name them, they stay stuck. And that's really important for releasing workplace trauma. 
Yeah. Other thing, of course, is really it's great to talk to someone who knows, who has some expertise who can help you move through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Amazing. Thank you so much, Marie. That was uh, very helpful as well. Um, how can people connect with you if they are curious to learn more? Well, I'm found on LinkedIn, Marie, Marie Gervais, G-E-R-V-A-I-S. <laughs> so Marie Gervais, I'm on LinkedIn. There are many, many women called Marie Gervais, but mine is a leadership training. So Marie Gervais leadership training uh, mm -hmm. on LinkedIn. And I also have a website, shiftworkplace.com. On the website, you can find my podcast, which is called Culture and Leadership Connections. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can also find my book, The Spirit of Work. So all of those things are there. You can find coaching courses and resources. We also have a leadership and culture library that you can sign up for and you get access to about 300 PDF documents of things that we have created over the, over the years that people have found useful. Very great. And is your book available on, on Amazon? Yes, it's on Amazon, Barnes Perfect. and Noble, Kobo. Um, it's on all the book directories. Okay, awesome. Great. Well, Marie, this was an absolute pleasure to listen to you today. Thank you so much for all of your wisdom that you shared with us. And I wish you all the best. And, um, you know, I'm working towards, you know, creating happier, healthier, more productive workplaces as well. So I'm really happy always to see that, you know, I'm not alone in this and that there's many other people that are striving to help companies and individuals get there as well. So thank you so much for your amazing work and I wish you all the best. Thank you. It's good to know we're all in this together.